Hello to all who are joining us today and welcome. I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life at Columbia University. Thank you all for being here. Today's forum is part of a broader series of conversations that University Life hosts about the pressing issues of our time. And it is hard to imagine a more globally and locally pressing issue in this moment than the coronavirus. We have more than 3,000 people registered to participate in today's forum from every Columbia school and every part of the university, along with alums and others. So please know that wherever you are watching this and whenever you are watching this, you continue to be part of a large and strong Columbia community. Welcome to, to others who are joining us from all parts of the country and the world. Hi everyone, Melanie Bernard, um, Associate Vice President and Medical Director for Columbia Health. Um, Suzanne Goldberg is having some technical difficulties as we, we do this, so she'll hopefully be jumping on shortly. We do have some comments from each of the speakers, um, an incredible um, group of speakers here. Um, so we can kick it off and, and let our first speaker introduce themselves. Um, Waffer or Scott? Is, Scott, are you up first? Yes, I think it's me. Great, it's me. Scott Hammer. Welcome everybody, this is Scott Hammer from the, the medical school and School of Public Health up in the up north in Manhattan. Uh, infectious disease and clinical virologist specialist. And I'm going to start off since we're a little bit late. Just Scott, recently. sorry, could you just adjust your volume? You're a little quiet. Thank you. Okay. Just to start off with a primer and some background information on our COVID 2 SARS agent. And just as far as for the general audience, Viruses, they may be an unseen pathogen to some, but if you turn on your electron microscope, you can see them. And over the last 50, 60 years, they've become less of an issue as far as being apparent because we have molecular biology, which is in sequencing and, and PCR, polymerase chain reaction studies that tell us these are real. And so it's just a matter of magnification. Now, the one thing about viruses that's important to remember which helps with any new agent or any old agent, is that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. This means that they cannot replicate or, or grow or duplicate by themselves. They need to hijack the cell machinery in order to replicate. So that's one important issue. And that tells us right away that viruses attack our cells and can either persist or be eliminated by the immune system or uh, kill the cell, but it also tells us that therapeutics, when we get to that discussion, are have to be really tailored to the organism because if it's using host cell machinery and you, you, t you tell, develop a drug that hurts the, the virus, you may be hurting the cell. And so that is where the toxicity comes in. Now, viruses come in two broad bands. One of them is to, uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and one is RNA, ribonucleic acid. And they're, they come as single-stranded or double-stranded viruses, and they also come with either a, lip, a lip, lip, lipid envelope or no lipid envelope. This allows the, uh, uh, this, this is important for the replication of the virus, how it grows in a cell, as well as what its susceptibility is to decontamination by alcohol and other agents of that nature. Now, there's no mystery in one sense to what, uh, to the infectious diseases caused by viruses. It's a host pathogen interaction that we, and it's, it's a balance of, the, of how the virus enters, where it goes, and what the immune system is to balance it. And the outcome of a, of a virus host interaction can be abortive infection, that is where the, the virus does not replicate and just is eliminated before it gets hold. And the other issues, it can, at other times it can replicate locally or spread by the bloodstream. And it, it can then be contained by the immune system. So many viruses like the, the common cold viruses can give a, give, give a little symptoms or be, but be a, totally eliminated from the host. The, but there's a range. So there are people who are asymptomatic with their viral infection despite replication. 
there are individuals who will develop mild symptoms, some will develop major symptoms, and some that will, depending upon the pathogen and what organ it's attacking, will, may die. So what determines the outcome? Well, it's the virus strain in a particular species, what its tropism is, that is, does it, what cells does it attack? And the preexistent immunity, this is, this is an important issue because for many viruses, we have cross immunity or previous immunity, either due to other pathogens that are re related to it or to vaccines. And this one thing about the COVID, COVID-2 virus isolate that we are dealing with now is that it's taken over the population because, and it's you know, a wide range of illness, but a good number of deaths. And that's because there is no preexistent immunity in the population. So these are important issues. And that these are the, that's the primer on virology. Now I'll just mention a few things, highlight about the coronaviruses that we can then move on to and, and talk more about in the question and answer period. So the coronaviruses, there are seven that infect humans. Four of these are cause mild respiratory illness and either a sore throat or, or the sniffles, and three have become serious. The history of the, the three serious ones are COVID-1, which is the SARS-1 virus, which was, which was with us in the early 2000s and caused 8,000 deaths and with I'm sorry, 800, 800, 800 deaths with 8,000 people infected. And that was the and SARS is severe acute respiratory syndrome. Then there was MERS, M-E-R-S, which is the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome that is in, centered in Saudi Arabia and surrounding countries. And then the, one, the pathogen we're dealing with today, which is SARS-CoV-2, that's severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, and this is the cause of COVID. The co co coronavirus-induced in disease. And just another, where we got this from, these are, these are non-human viruses to start with as far as the coronaviruses, and they, they, they go to, into humans uh, when, they, when they change. So for example, with, with COVID-2, the bats are the host species. They often go into an intermediate host. In this case, it's not clear what the intermediate host is, but it can be a pangolin, which is an unusual organ or an unusual animal. And then kick over to man. With the SARS-1 epidemic, it was civets, C-I-V-E-T, which were the intermediate host. These are potentiated by the food markets. Both of these pathogens were in the food, were in the, in the animal kingdom, and got in, and got into the food. Were brought to the food markets, which, if you've seen any pictures of the food markets in in China, just are quite amazing and are a perfect laboratory for mixing of viruses. And it's, it's felt that there's a recombinant ev event that is parts of more than one coronavirus from different species mixed together and caused a new virus that was able to attack the human, humans and infect humans and without previous immunity has caused a real problem. So that's how we got, got to where we are. Now man acquires this by intersecting it. The initial infection is uh, usually by the respiratory route uh, and we pick up the this is just an important point. We pick up the virus through being coughed on or sneezed on or being touching a contaminated surface. And we and touch, we, and then we take our contaminated hand and we touch our mouth or our nose or our eye and through the, the, what's called the mucous membrane, these, these viruses can get into the body. Uh, this, the issue of droplet versus airborne contamination is an important distinction. Droplet is a larger size cough or sneeze, small volume of fluid that we all know about. And it, it goes maybe three feet into the area. And 
that's why the the recommendation is to stay apart. However, the argument about N95 masks is the fact that if, if the virus is aerosolized, it's a smaller particle and can be breathed into the lungs and go down to the lower respiratory tract and cause infection and, and establishment and, and disease. This is, we can talk more about this in the questions, but this is part of the, the, the issue about N95 masks versus surgical masks. Now, diagnosis very quickly is suspicion, is the availability of kits and diagnostics. There are some laboratory tests that you can do to have you think you're in the ballpark and, and chest x-rays and chest CAT scan, CT scans. But the real issue is the te testing for the organism. And as everybody knows, and we'll talk more about it, the polymerase chain reaction test looking for the viral RNA is the diagnostic of, of, of critical nature. Now, one thing I would say, we'll talk about the incubation period. The incubation period from exposure to clinical illness is in the range of two to 12 days or two to 14 days with a peak of around five or six days. Uh, we don't know how long the virus sheds. We have some idea, but we're not clear. And we don't know whether the, the, the RNA is, shows infectious virus for that duration or not. I would just mention that uh, along with testing, the thing that we're gonna be talking about also is antibody assays and what they tell us. And lastly, treatments. And I would just state that there's no proven treatment and we'll come back to this. There are possibilities that have been out there and talked about a lot. Convalescent plasma, hydroxychloroquine, remdes remdesivir, just to name three, and anti-IL-6, which is an immune modulator. I would just mention that this has led to debates both in, in the public and, and scientific media about randomized clinical trials versus compassionate care. And the last issue that we'll talk about today is vaccine. And I think I'll stop there to let Suzanne move on with the program. But we'll come back to those points that I mentioned. Uh, thank you so much, or I should say Dr. Hammer, thank you so much. Uh, really grateful. And um, my Zoom cut out before I got to the part in, the, in my introduction where I could explain what to do in case of technical difficulty. So I will share <laughs> that in just a moment. Um, uh, but with the group's permission, I'll just give, have a, a bit of a pause in the discussion about science and public health to share a little bit more about the background context for uh, all of us at the university. And then we'll turn over to Dr. El Sadr to talk more specifically about some of the other aspects of public health. Um, I think where, where I, when I paused, I was talking about the, 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 you know, that we are at, at Columbia, the size of a small city, about 15,000, about 50,000 in all, and not one person in our community has been untouched by this pandemic. Uh, and I was speaking in particular uh, when I froze about the thousands of undergraduates who so quickly moved away from campus, others who, are re who remain and are relocating as we speak, students at Bard Hall uptown who have done the same, graduate students who are making adjustments here at, at home, and at home. Um, students and faculty have quickly moved to online teaching and have significantly or temper altered or temporarily ended on campus research. There are staff on and off campus doing heroic work to enable the university to operate under circumstances that were unimaginable uh, even a few weeks ago. I also want to recognize the families and friends who have welcomed students back into your homes much earlier in the school year than any of us could have imagined. I'm personally grateful for the leadership of President Bollinger and for the wisdom and fortitude of our provost, our interim provost, Ira Katz Nelson, along with all of Columbia's deans and institute and center leaders, the members of the university's COVID-19 task force, university senate leaders, many student government leaders, and many other colleagues and students from around the university who are supporting our community in ways large and small. Special thanks too to the University Life team for putting this uh, forum together this afternoon 
This will be the largest scale Zoom event that Columbia has done to date. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at, at more. Uh, as I wrote to students recently, it seems hard even to remember life as it was a week ago, let alone longer in time. Indeed, in early February, we convened a university life forum about COVID-19. And none of us in that moment could have imagined that we'd be gathered seven weeks later on Zoom with classes online, with our university libraries closed, and with New York and much of the rest of the world under orders to stay home. We did see then, and we continue to see now, a disturbing rise in bias and hostility toward Chinese and Asian and Asian American students and others in our own community and in the state and around the world. Here, I want to underscore how contrary this is to our university values of inclusion, belonging, and respect for each other's common humanity, even and especially across our differences and in this moment across our time, many time zones and in online forums as well as in person. I want to add too, and, and we'll hear more of this as the discussion continues, um, that I have been tremendously inspired by the ways in which members of our community, including every person in this, in this forum this afternoon, and many students, faculty and staff, have gone above and beyond to care for themselves and each other in this incredibly uh, challenging time. Whether we look locally or nationally or globally, we see a growing number of infections, as Dr. Hammer was just talking about, a growing number of tragic deaths and a surging need for all of the resources, human and otherwise, that healthcare providers can muster. And this includes at our own Columbia Med Irving Medical Center campus. Everywhere we look, the world as we know it, and as we expected it to be after spring break on campus feels like it has been turned upside down. At the same time, one, what remains steady and is an extraordinary point of pride is the way that Columbia and the individuals that make up this community are contributing in extraordinary ways to addressing the virus, which we, will, which we started to hear about from Dr. Hammer, we will continue to hear about uh, as we turn to our other speakers. Um, I want to, and to maintaining our commitment, our profound mission, commit, commitment and mission to advancing knowledge at the, and learning at the highest levels and sharing that knowledge with the world. So I want to say a few quick words on about our format, which you've probably gotten a sense of already. Um, first about questions, then technical difficulties, and uh, finally university resources. For questions, um, many of you have submitted questions already, thank you. Those of you who have questions, I think I've already discovered the chat feature at the bottom of Zoom. You can post your questions there. Uh, audience mics are muted, uh, so please use this feature if you have questions. I also want to recognize that there are many questions on other very important issues that are not the focus of today's forum, including about online classes, housing, human resources, and more. These discussions are ongoing in schools and at workplaces throughout the university. There are also other forums in the works uh, that will address social, political, and economic dimensions and questions related to this pandemic, and we'll post that information over time on University Life's website. If you do have suggestions for events or questions or otherwise, you can always reach us by email at universitylife at columbia.edu. Second, technical difficulties. If you have difficulties, try to do what I did, which is log off of Zoom and then log back on. Um, if any of the other speakers during our forum has this difficulty, you'll see them do the same thing. And you can also watch the live stream on University Life's website now, and that's universitylife.columbia.edu. Uh, finally, uh, before I turn to, to introductions that haven't already happened, uh, the university's COVID-19 website is full of resources and information. If you haven't looked at it recently, I encourage you to take a look. It's covid19.columbia.edu. And for additional student resources, you can always look at the University Life website. So with that, I was going to introduce Scott but, uh, Hammer, but he introduced himself, himself with my thanks. And I will now turn over to Dr. 
Wafa El Sadr. Dr. El Sadr is not only an MD, but also holds a Master of Public Health and Masters of Public Administration. She is the director of ICAP at Columbia University. She is a university professor of epidemiology and medicine. She is the Dr. Mathilde Krim Amphar Professor of Global Health and director of the Mailman School of Public Health's Global Health Initiative. And she's a member of Mayor de Blasio's COVID-19 Scientific Advisory Council. Um, and one of the things that I intended to say at the outset, but we'll see now, is that I encourage you after the forum to Google everybody who is speaking because they are all tremendously accomplished. And, I, and you will be enriched even by learning uh, much more than I've been able to share here about what each of them has done. So Dr. Al Sadr, I'll turn it over to you. And then I'll, we'll follow by introducing Lou Baptista Neto, and then after that, Mel Dr. Melanie Burnett. Wafa. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Suzanne, and uh, for the invitation. Thank you for uh, having me join my esteemed colleagues on this, uh, on this webinar. Uh, what I'm going to do is build on what Scott um, just uh, talked about and tell you a little bit more about the disease and particularly about the epidemiology um, and, and also maybe uh, try to think about what to anticipate in the future. So as was mentioned earlier by Scott, this, um, this virus, uh, the first uh, cases of, of uh, COVID-19 were identified in China in the city of Wuhan. And that was in about mid-December. And since then until today, there are today a total of uh, more than uh, 435,000 cases around the world of COVID-19. So the spread has been rapid and uh, both in terms of uh, within the country, uh, across the globe, across countries as well as within countries. Now in China has borne the, most of the brunt of this uh, pandemic with a total of 81,000 cases. However, I think we've learned a lot from the experience of China because they've had so many cases. And I think some of these lessons learned I'd like to highlight now. As Scott mentioned, it takes from the time of infection to develop the disease is about an average of five days, but it could be as short as two days up to 10 days or even longer. What's really important is that uh, to note is that the majority of cases of people who get infected with this virus will have mild to moderate disease. 80% of people will have mild to moderate disease, and that's very reassuring. Only about 15% will have severe symptoms and 5% will be critical, will be very sick. What we've also learned is that um, there, is a, there are subpopulations that are at particularly high risk of complications and severe symptoms. And those are people who are elderly, as well as those who have uh, other medical, serious medical conditions like heart disease and lung disease and so on and so forth. What's interesting is that it appears that children appear to have very mild infections, which is uh, reassuring. Now, in terms of what happens when somebody gets COVID-19 is that usually mild to moderate illness and usually that symptoms resolve within about two weeks. However, with more severe disease, it can take longer, three to four weeks or so. And then of course, people who are very critical, it can take even longer than that. Now, as was discussed, I think the, um, the, the let me talk about the global picture now. And I think, uh, the most, uh, as was mentioned, first China was severely affected, and then other Asian countries like South, uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And then because of course of enormous travel across the globe, uh, other parts of the world started to get severely affected. And now at present, there are two reasons, uh, two regions in the world with the most concern are Western European countries, Europe overall, as well as the United States. So if you look at the most uh, recent data, uh, for example, Italy has the second largest numbers of cases after China, and then the US has the largest, the third largest number of cases uh, after Italy. So the US now has overall about 50, 55,000 cases. And as you know, uh, in New York State, there are almost 30,000 cases and New York City, about 17,000 cases. So this has been a rapid spread around the globe. Now there are interesting, um, there are also uh, important issues to, to keep in mind in terms of how do you respond to such an epidemic or a pandemic. And there are, real, there are very well established 
recognize principles that we use to tackle a situation like this. Firstly, number one is obviously you have to identify it. And fortunately in China, they were able to rapidly identify the virus within a few days. Actually, the scientists there were identified the virus and within a few more days, they were able to identify the structure of the virus and to share that structure with the global community. So that's fantastic. That means that it allows um, researchers around the world to be able, and it allowed them to be able to develop the diagnostic test to be able to test for the virus, as well as to start thinking and looking for treatments, as well as to also start looking for vaccines. I think what, uh, what thereafter, I think then, so that's number one is identifying the, the, the disease itself and the outbreak, the beginning of the outbreak. The next phase is what we call containment. And that's very important. And during that phase, what's really critical is to rapidly identify any case, like any case of COVID-19, and to be able to isolate that case and identify the close contacts to that case, and then to have those close contacts quarantined. And this is what's usually done in this phase of containment. As you can imagine, it requires a lot of resources to be able to go out and find every single case and also trace every contact and make sure that they're either in isolation or quarantine and then continue this effort in concentric circles around every case. And what happens unfortunately is uh, with a condition like COVID-19 because it's so highly transmissible is that very soon communities and resources are just not able to cope with the numbers of cases and numbers of contacts. And we move towards the third phase which is mitigation, which we're in now in New York City and in the US and in Western Europe. And that's the phase when you're focusing not so much on individual behaviors, but now on focusing on the population overall. And that's where you uh, speak to the population and like we're doing now, uh, social distancing is very important to decrease as much as possible the density of the population, to break those uh, links of transmission and then to, of course, try to promote uh, uh, behaviors uh, that are very useful to prevent transmission, like frequent hand washing and, and so on and so forth. Then hopefully mitigation will, do, will help in breaking uh, the, the, the cycles of transmission, the links of transmission, and allow us to then uh, flatten the curve of the epidemic. Beyond mitigation and hopefully after successful mitigation, we would then go into the phase of recovery. And uh, I have to say that responding to a pandemic is very critically important, but the phase of recovery is equally important. And we haven't even started thinking about the recovery phase uh, from this epidemic. And through it all, what's really important, most critical, is frequent communication and uh, inform dissemination of information from trusted uh, sources of information. Uh, because at the time of pandemics like this, this is when rumors and misconceptions and conspiracy theories flourish. So I think that's really critical that we, uh, as much as possible, uh, try to uh, prevent any uh, dissemination of such uh, misinformation. I think I'd like to also tell you there's some good news. I mean, I think in terms of uh, the response and in terms of where we're at, I think one of the pieces of news that is really good is the, the rapidity by which, as I mentioned, the virus was identified and characterized and the rapidity of development of a test and so on and so forth. This is really amazing in the history of uh, pandemics. Number two has been the lessons learned. There's a uh, Every day we're learning more, we're learning how it's transmitted. For example, now we know it's likely transmitted by people who don't have symptoms yet. Probably not as infectious as somebody who's sneezing and coughing, but still there's a risk for somebody who doesn't have symptoms. We're learning every day and we're trying to disseminate this information every day. We're also learning from success stories in terms of other countries that have tackled uh, this pandemic. I think China is an enormous success story. And um, I think China was able to mobilize very rapidly and definitively and put in place a remarkable uh, social distancing interventions very early on and across the country. And by doing so, I believe they have been able to avert numerous, numerous uh, disease and, and mortality within China. I think other success stories have been in South Korea 
and in Singapore and in Hong Kong, and they've used, they've had different kinds of epidemics, but nonetheless, they've had a success story in terms of controlling uh, the epidemic in those countries. So I think there are, uh, these are important um, success stories, and I think these are also um, uh, very valuable lessons for us as we move forward. I th think what we're doing now, and all of you are experiencing through having to do this virtually, this forum virtually, as well as everybody scattered all over the world, we are trying to effectively put in place social distancing. And I see around me, people are much more observing um, of, uh, of the behavioral messaging and interventions that we have been trying to disseminate over the past um, several, we've been trying to disseminate over the past several, um, several weeks. So I'll end with four messages to keep in mind. One is stay informed and please identify uh, trusted sources of information. The ones that Suzanne mentioned are particularly trusted here at Columbia, as well as the website for the Centers for Disease Control, for example. Uh, these are trusted sources of information that I would recommend highly. Number two, you have to act on the evidence. Please uh, anchor your actions in evidence. And if you have questions, do ask. Um, do ask us, do ask others. Uh, so that we can provide you with the evidence so your actions are driven by evidence. Number three, remain calm. I always say one can be careful, but one should not panic. That's really, there's a big distinction between those two. And number four, uh, stick to the facts and try to disseminate the right information and to overcome rumors and misconceptions. Uh, all of us have a responsibility to be, to amplify uh, these um, this information that you're going to hear today so that we can actually help others to stay connected and to stay informed and to stay safe. Thank you, Suzanne, and I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Rafa. And I think what you have just done for us is really given our marching orders. Right? So I think many of us who are not healthcare professionals and are not public health experts wonder what we can do um, in addition to following social distancing guidelines and so forth. And the reality is that any of us who is listening, anyone who is listening to this uh, discussion today now is going to leave with a lot of information that we can share with our friends, with our families, with our coworkers to help do exactly what you're talking about, which is the critical piece that every person has to do in a pandemic, educate self and educate others in addition to following this guidance. So what I'm going to do now is first give uh, Dr. Hammer a fuller introduction as I had originally intended, and then uh, turn to introduce Dr. Lou Baptiste Neto. So Dr. Hammer is the, the Harold C. New Professor of Infectious Diseases and Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Dr. Hammer served for 20 years as the Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Columbia Medical Center where he focused on antiretroviral therapy and pro preventative HIV vaccine development among many other areas of his work. Uh, so thank you again for jumping in uh, without a, a, a full introduction. Uh, and now I'm, I'm really uh, very uh, honored and delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Lou Baptista Neto. Dr. Baptista Neto is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. He oversaw the conversion and expansion of, tele, of, of telepsychiatry services to provide care to patients in light of COVID-19. He oversees all clinical mental health services at the Medical Center at Columbia, and he leads the well-being initiative for Columbia doctors, which launched counseling and support resources for all faculty and house staff at the Medical Center. And we're really delighted to have you here, Dr. Baptista Neto, to talk with us about mental health and well being, which I know is so much on the minds of everybody in the world right now. Sure. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me and see me well? Yes. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goldberg. I'm glad to be here and for the opportunity to have this conversation with our uh, Columbia community. So as Dr. Goldberg said, you know, I am a psychiatrist here at Columbia, but I feel that I'm here as a peer, as a fellow member of the Columbia community who's going through similar challenges as everyone else during these times. So the idea here is that we share experiences, knowledge, 
and we support each other. So that's why forums like this are so important. So let me start by you know, making some comments about the psychological aspect of this uh, situation, the COVID crisis. So I don't mean to get into any major details about mental health treatment or anything like that, but just trying to uh, normalize this experience for all of us. So in the last you know, several days or a couple of weeks, I've been asked numerous times by many of my colleagues or friends about the whole range of emotions that people are experiencing. And people ask me, is that normal? Is it normal to be feeling more anxious, more stressed? And the quick answer is yes, it is normal, but not only normal, it is expected. In a way, it's a little bit of a humbling experience in times of stress and crisis, because it is a reminder that we are human beings and we're all going to react to situations like this. So it is normal and it is expected. So if we think about it, right, this is really new territory for most of us, for everyone. So it is natural to expect that the, the emotional responses, the experience, also is gonna feel a little bit different, a little bit awkward, out of place, and that can get us a little bit off balance, you know, and, and the range of emotions can really be very variable in intensity, in quality, in timing. So people can react very differently in, in times of stress, in times of crisis, so in that is again in timing in intensity in quality so think about not only our own ability to cope our usual reactions to stress but this is an extraordinary situation right we haven't gone through this before so there will be newer experiences that's going to feel a little uncomfortable to us but it is important to understand that people react differently so for example Right? There are people that in times of stress, they tend to be a little quieter right? and internalize you know, what's going on. Some people need to talk about it in order to cope. Some people might have some initial reactions and then with time they adjust and adapt. And some people might not have a lot of reaction initially, but down the line, they will start experiencing a lot of emotions and reactions. So it's very important not only to be aware of our own reactions, but understand that people around us might react differently in different times, and we need to understand and we need to respect that. If we think about the whole range of experiences that we've been going through right now, in many ways, has a lot of similarities with a grief reaction, right? So think about it, we lost our way of life our security, our routine, our identity in many ways, right? Everything's put on hold in a way. So there is a little bit of a perception of loss, right? And then the whole spectrum of reaction that can go with it, for example, right? If we think about several days ago, you know, our sense of shock and disbelief, I think the word that I, I heard and used very often was surreal, felt and still feel a little bit surreal this whole situation. And then we start going through that phase of hoping and fantasize that, uh, you know, we're gonna win the war in a couple of weeks and life will go back to normal. And as time goes by, this is not happening. Our reactions will continue to change as well, right? So then from a sense of shock and disbelief, we might move into, you know, some degree of sadness and maybe anger and a sense of injustice why is this happening now? What is this happening to me? What is this happening to us, right? And that will gradually continue to transform as the situation evolves. All this, you know, there might be some fluctuating levels of fear and anxiety. And if the spectrum continues, at some point, we get as individuals and as a system into a place of acceptance and reality, and then being able to adjust and adapt and move on. So any one of us can be of any place in this spectrum right now. Having said that, right, there's no, there's no real words that can change many aspects of the reality we are right now. Right? We can change the economy, you know, overnight. We cannot, you know, fix the PPE, you know, shortage without having PPE available. 
However, there are actions and behaviors that we all can take now that can help. They can help us as individuals. They can help the people around us. So think about it as a marathon, not as a sprinter. So actions that we take it now might have an impact not only in the near future, in our day to day, but down the line when we might need the most, right? We're still in that holding pattern. How long would this last, right? So we have the opportunity to start behaving and taking actions now that will help us down the line. So the idea is to really build and maintain resilience and becoming more intentional about it. So what I mean by that is that for the most part, we are resilient. We have a toolkit that we tend to use in a day-to-day, -day, right? To cope with day-to-day -day stress, to maintain health and resilience. What happened is, is that in times of stress and crisis, almost like we forgot we have them. We're not accessing them as automatically and as easily as we normally do. So the opportunity now is again, is to be intentional. Think about every you know, behavior that you had in place prior to this crisis. What helped you? And there's no one size fits all, right? What did you do on a day to day to help you go through the days and manage with day to day stress? It can be anything, right? It can be listening to music or exercising, meditation, yoga, connecting with people. So think about the tools that worked for you before, and that's the time to bring it back, be intentional about it. Now, it is harder to learn and use new skills and new strategies during a time of crisis. It doesn't mean that we cannot do it, right? So we have to rely on trying to rescue what works, and at the same time, if we have the opportunity, utilize you know, new strategies. Now, there are some general rules that I think I'm sure many of you have already put in place that can help us. For example, maintaining some sense of routine and normalcy in this new reality is helpful, whether it's around your sleep schedule, if you can, or your eating habits, or your exercise routine, or connecting with people. It is important to keep some familiarity, some routine, not only kids regress without structure and routine, adults can do that as well. So try to find some ways of maintaining some, some routine on a, your day-to-day -day right now. The other thing is that think about purpose, right? I, I, you know, I mentioned that before. A, a lot of things are on hold for us right now, right? Whether it's schooling or work, and we, we tend to attach purpose and motivation and identity you know, to these things. So it might feel a little bit off balance and perhaps feeling powerless or almost paralyzed right now. So reflect on it. Where can you, you know, repurpose, find some purpose? You know, people cope often by seeking information, but also taking actions. And I think taking actions give us this sense of we're not so powerless about it. It can be anything. Can you help a neighbor? Can you help an elderly neighbor who needs groceries? Can you work on relationships that you didn't have time before or embark on a learning experience that you're interested but you didn't have much of time? So try to find some purpose right now to give you some motivation to go through this. Now, let me say just a couple of words on kids because I have this question all the time. So. What, 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 how can I talk to kids and how, what should I say to my kids? So these are some general rules. Uh, one, think developmentally. Talking to a five-year-old, 11-year-old, or 16-year-old is very different, right? A five-year-old still has a very blurred sense of reality and fantasy. So you gotta really adjust, you know, to, you gotta talk to them in a language that we understand. Nobody knows their kids better than their parents or their caregivers. Too much information might not be helpful, right? They can create anxiety if they don't really understand so much. So trying to measure what you're telling them in a language that they can understand. You know, for 11-year-olds, they tend to be very concrete. It's black and white, right? So concrete, clear information, you know, for them 
you know, can be very helpful. And of course, adolescents are already thinking in a way cognitively, some, you know, somewhat emotionally closer to an adult. But as a general rule for them, you do want to limit the exposure to uh, media. You know, I think we have this drive to be on all the time. I think help us cope. So we're not missing out some important information, but it's important to trying to limit, especially for younger kids. They'll get bits and pieces they would not fully understand that that might cause more fear and misconceptions. The other thing, regardless of age, they need routine and maintaining some, you know, routine for the kids is very helpful. And, and lastly, Neto, I'm just, I'm going to just give you the 15 second warning oh, so that we can come back and, and, and uh, go to Dr. Burnett's and then we'll come back. Okay. Thank you. So, more important, arguably, than give them information as important is, is let them ask you questions because that will give you uh, good information about what actually they're thinking and worrying about. You know, I'll finish by giving a quick, a quick example. So, you know, you can give the whole lecture on COVID to your teenager and then at the end of the conversation, they're going to ask, okay, so, but when can I see my friends? Or what will happen to my haircut? So let them ask questions. They will give you the opportunity to really address what they're really anxious about and clarify, you know, the information. There are silver linings, and we can talk about this later. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I, I know what you've just shared is invaluable. We see a lot of scientific and, and medical information and not always, we don't always have so much access to, to guidance. And I think as, as uh, uh, Dr. El Sadr did, Two, you've given us some concrete tools and guidance for what we might do both with respect to seeing what we already have in our lives and our sources of resilience that we actually didn't realize we had, and also to think about where our purpose is in this moment and find ways to, to draw on that. Um, so I'd like to turn uh, quickly now to Dr. Melanie Burnitz, who is a close colleague and is in addition to being an MD and has a master's of public health. She is associate vice president and medical director for Columbia Health, associate clinical professor of medicine in the Center for Family and Community Medicine. Dr. Burnitz convenes the university's infectious disease working group and is a member of the university's COVID-19 task force along with Dr. El Sadr, Dr. Hammer and me. This is the group that oversees the university's response. In addition, she is ensuring that camp our campus health services provide care for students during this crisis, both in person and virtually. And before, Do Dr. Burnus, before I turn to you, I want to just remind our viewers that after you speak, um, we will be jumping right into questions. We have a lot of questions that I know people are anxious to hear responses to about how really more, more details on transmission, on masks, on um, on where to go and should people leave New York or stay in New York, as well as mental health and Columbia specific questions. So thank you very much for keeping the questions coming and Dr. Burnett, it's over to you. Thank you, Suzanne, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm hoping to share a brief overview of the policies that we've put in place to ensure the health of our Columbia campuses. Um, and as you all know, Columbia started focusing our efforts on COVID-19 response back in mid-January. And while we've heard a lot about the emotions that are engendered by this crisis, one of the emotions I feel, especially in an afternoon like this, is pride to be part of this Columbia community and having seen the way we have responded as a community to this pandemic. I first wanted to provide some background into how the university has planned and addressed the institutional response to COVID-19. And as Suzanne mentioned, we have a an infectious disease working group, which is a subset of the university's emergency management operations team, formed actually way back in 2008 to address pandemic flu. And this group convenes regularly um, to address any emerges, emerging infectious disease threat. It's comprised of representatives from across our campus offices, um, really to bring together the expertise. And we've used this forum in the past to address flu, meningitis, measles, Zika, Ebola, and so much more. So this group started convening in mid-January, and we've met weekly since, um, really to ensure proper cooperation and collaboration across the campus, to ensure we were up to date with the current status of the outbreak um, and the campus needs and providing action plans as the situation grew. 
Um, this group initially helped provide the guidance to, re to returning travelers and then more broadly to the pandemic response plan, plan for the university. This is actually a plan that's been operationalized and has been guiding the university's response during this pandemic. Early on, the university also convened the COVID-19 task force, which brings together senior university leadership together with public health, infectious disease and epidemiology expertise, both from the university and from the medical center. We've been meeting daily, sometimes twice a day, um, nights and weekends to ensure that the university is reacting in real time, as well as proactively around all the elements of the COVID-19 response. The task force has been charged with operationalizing the response plan. And this plan's really guided us as we move through all the different stages that Dr. Alsada discussed um, around the contingencies for COVID-19, including planning ahead for what we would do if we started to see sustained community transmission within New York City, as well as um, restrictions in public transportation disruptions and movement restrictions. So, so a lot of that intention was put in um, prior to this. Each phase was outlined in detail. Um, so we had the building blocks in place and the university operations teams in place ready to respond. Um, as you all have seen, the university has a preparedness website and from early on the FAQ site was set up there for COVID-19. We continue to update that site daily. Please use it as a resource as well as now a university landing page on the columbia.edu homepage. You can link directly to the COVID-19 landing page, which has a, a, a wide array of resources. Additionally, we have a COVID-19 hotline, 212-854-9355, available to the Columbia community, nine to five, Monday to Friday, staffed by nurses from Columbia Health. To date, that hotline has received over 2,000 calls and is available to help you um, with any of your questions. We've been connecting with our colleagues at the New York City Department of Health and as well as continually reviewing any state and CDC guidelines. So we're really working in real time with guidance to ensure we give the proper recommendations to our community. We started messaging the community back in January and since then there's been dozens of community messages including health advisories from me around early stages of the outbreak, transmission symptoms, travel restrictions, CDC recommendations, self-care, prevention and so on. We also monitored returning travelers um, earlier on in the outbreak and provided guidance on self-isolation. As we've begun to see transmission, widespread transmission in New York City, we shared this with our community as, long, uh, as well as with the guidance on social distancing um, and the changes that have been made based on that around contact tracing and quarantine recommendations, which we can speak to later on. We've also had messaging from the interim provost, Dean Goldman, around um, academic changes, study abroad and campus events, as well as President Bollinger's communications around suspension of classes, virtual teaching, move out for student, undergraduate students and so on. We also shared when our first Columbia affiliate was diagnosed with COVID-19. So as you've heard, there's currently widespread transmission of COVID-19 within New York City. And what this means is that this infection is actively circulating within our community. As such, the New York City Department of Health is no longer conducting tr contact tracing and is limiting testing for the more serious cases and those needing hospitalization, where the efforts, as you've heard, are really being focused is on reducing community transmission. We do continue to see a small but growing number of cases of COVID-19 in our affiliates and expect to see those numbers um, continue to increase. As I mentioned, the Department of Health is not doing contact tracing of known cases. So unless the case tells you, you may not be notified. And that's really important just in terms of thinking about how you continue to reduce your risk of transmission. Um, Columbia University, we cannot share protected health information about individuals with other members of our community. But when we are aware of a high risk contact and we do have consent, we do share that information. But in general, everyone should assume they've been exposed and act accordingly. So really remember to take the crucial measures that you've been hearing throughout. Stay home if you're sick. Isolate yourself as much as possible if you're sick. If you're not feeling sick, practice social distancing. Stay home as much as possible. Practice the essential prevention hygiene that we've talked about. Frequent hand washing, coughing or sneezing into your cough or elbow. Sanitizing high touch surfaces frequently. Avoiding touching your face with unwashed hands. Um, not sharing food or drink. Maintain that six foot distance between yourself and others whenever possible. 
Um, especially look out for the older adults or those who have serious chronic, chronic underlying health conditions, really wanting to avoid their exposure. And if you do have symptoms, so cough, fever, shortness of breath, sore throat, stay home. If your symptoms are mild, you don't necessarily need to seek medical care. But if you do, do so virtually. Call your doctor, use the virtual health options that are available to you. Obviously, if you're a member of a higher risk community that I described, or if your symptoms are severe, such as difficulty breathing, bluish lips, confusion, contact your primary care provider right away. Um, if you're going to the emergency room, often it's a good idea to try and call first so that they can be aware of your arrival. Columbia students, remember to reach out to your campus health services at Morningside or at CUIMC and faculty and staff to contact your primary care provider. Um, if your symptoms don't go away after a few days, then call your, your doctor if you haven't already. The good news is in about 80% of cases, symptoms resolve by themselves with supportive care. So resting, taking fluids, taking fever, reducing medications such as Tylenol. And if you have had a case of COVID-19, you should stay home for at least seven days after your symptoms first start, and for at least three days after you no longer have a fever without needing to use fever reducing medications, or if you never had a fever for three days after you had cough um, or shortness of breath. Um, I wanted to remind you all of the resources just very briefly, um, acknowledging that many of our students are no longer on campus and many of you are staying home. For the Columbia students, our resources have transitioned to virtual. So for the Morningside students, visit the health.columbia.edu website. And for the CUIMC students, visit um, student, your student health website to find out you have access to all your usual resources virtually. And I'm happy to discuss those some more. So finally, I just wanted to thank you all for the part you're playing by staying home, by supporting your friends and family, or by being an essential worker during this time. Dr. Bernitz, thank you so much. And in your uh, discussion just now, you actually answered a number of questions we've had, both about is Columbia going to publish the names or, or numbers of people who have been infected? And, um, and as you said, we don't share uh, personal health information with uh, others around the university. It's a central Bit tenet of privacy protection, but also a question a number of people have asked, which is what do I do if I feel sick? And you've told us that what to do is if you have mild symptoms, monitor them. You can get in touch with your doctor virtually. You don't need to go out, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't need to go out and get tested. What you should be doing is taking care of yourself like you would with, with any other illness, only keep at a remove from the others in your household to risk possibly infecting them as well. But if you have difficulty breathing or if you're in a high risk group or you have some other, or, or you feel that it's, it's not actually a mild situation, to be directly in touch with your primary care provider and call ahead if you're going to an emergency room. Is that quick synopsis? Absolutely correct. And I think the one thing that we've heard a lot, the fevers that, pe that patients are getting with COVID-19 can be pretty high. And that's really scary for people when you look at your thermometer and you see a temperature of 103. Um, if you're able to reduce that temperature with um, fever reducing medications such as Tylenol, that on its own is not an indication that you need to go to the emergency room. But high fevers are scary to people. Again, the reasons to really seek out emergency medical care would be the difficulty breathing or if you're a member of a high risk group. Thank you. So here's what I'm going to propose to our forum speakers. Um, something like a lightning round so that we can get, have as much information out there as we can. And so I'm going to ask smaller questions and ask whoever wants to jump in to jump in and give a very brief answer and then we'll be able to elaborate one by one, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Hammer, I think this is probably for you, but um, it may be for others as well, um, which is, uh, can I be infected if I stay six feet away from other people? What exactly, and, and setting aside the surfaces issue, what exactly do I need to do? Do I need to be wearing a mask to keep myself protected? Do I need to stay six feet away for 10 minutes or just in the moment as I'm passing someone on the street? What, 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 is, what, is, what are my risks when I'm near other people? Even so, if feet so away? Thank you. So thank you for, for that question. If you stay six feet away in, from other people, 
you don't have to do, you don't, you do not have to wear a mask in the sense of, because the, the mask issue is for droplet and potentially for a little bit of airborne, but mostly droplet. And that, and the, the, the concentration of virus in, the, in a sneeze or a cough or a breath falls off inversely proportional to the square root, the square of the distance. So it, the difference between three feet and six feet is an exponential difference. It's not just a doubling. So if you, if you don't have to wear a mask, it's in that sense, a surgical mask on your face when you're six feet away from everybody else is not gonna incre incrementally improve things. So I think if you can really do that, and you're, you're, you're set. Some people, lightning question number two for whoever wants this one. Um, some people, when either they go shopping or get order in food, if you're still in New York City or in a place where food is delivered, wonder whether they need to bleach everything that they take into their apartment or otherwise wipe it down uh, before they put it away or even touch it. So anybody? I'll, I'll just start quickly. I think if it makes you, if it reassures you, you should do it. But it's, it, and I think that it makes it's reasonable sense with the prevalence we have, but it's not, I mean, if you do frequent hand washing and adhere to the personal hygiene, you're set. But it doesn't hurt to wipe things down, but I wouldn't take it to a compulsively abnormal state. And so you, you still have to live and be reasonable. Um, I see Dr. Osada nodding along too as, our, as a public health expert in this area. Um, if, you, if you think you have been infected but you weren't tested and now you are feeling better and you've observed what Dr. Burnett said about staying home for three days, I think it is, after your fever has, you're, you're no longer needing to treat a fever. Um, if you believe you have been infected and you're now feeling better, can you still infect other people? So I just want to clarify, because I've seen some questions yeah. come up and the confusion of the days, right? Yeah. In isolation was 14 days. So we were telling people if you were exposed to someone to a close mm -hmm. contact, stay home for 14 days. That's because of the incubation period that can span anywhere from two days to 14 days. Then we're talking different numbers for people who are infected and who think they've been infected. So the first number is seven days. If you've been infected, your minimum time staying home where you're thought to be shedding virus is seven days. In addition, you need to have three days of having no fever or no other symptoms. So if on day four, your fever goes away, maybe at the end of seven days, you're not shedding virus, but it could be longer. So it could be up to 14 days or potentially even longer. So it's a little bit confusing in terms of thinking through the days. So minimum of seven days after your symptoms start, but at least 72 hours without fever and without taking medications to reduce your fever. And there have, just to add one small thing is that there have been, I, I think implicit in this question is, if you're feeling well after you've had an episode of COVID-19 and, and you beyond that period, can you still be shedding virus? And there are limited data from very small studies uh, that showed that in a small number, and I again reiterate it's a small number, they were able to recover uh, some virus from some people who have recovered. It's unclear whether these individuals had completely cleared their virus before or, uh, and whether it's just that people who do have this infection, they, they, they intermittently shed virus. Most importantly, we don't know whether such individuals who are shedding small amount of virus are infectious to others. And that's the most important thing to keep in mind is that obviously if you're sneezing and coughing and producing uh, large numbers of droplets with the virus in them, that's when you're most infectious. And I think that's uh, the contribution of these other kind of uh, potential infections, whether you're asymptomatic or post-infection is unknown. Can I just on this? Oh, go ahead, I Dr. interject Cameron. that, uh, and the, I don't want to dominate with this, this topic the rest of the question period, but we could do that. The issue of the, the rules and regulations that have been put forward are consensus and they're important and they're reasonable, but they're framed in the sense of the restraints that we have, the restraints on the the numbers of cases and the, on the health, the stretching of the health worker, caseworker, 
health worker for us, the limitations on testing, the limitations on, on, on of swabs. And so in an ideal world, and maybe, and I may differ from my colleagues, I think that there is a room for more testing in the, in the issue of in relaying anxiety in building a database and doing some population-based testing that tells us more about these things. We do not know really how long the virus sheds and the data we'll have is PCR data that is not infectious virus data. Mm -hmm. So we need, and we also don't know the issue of how you clear the virus with, a, with an antibody response. And a number of people, a number of groups are looking at that because an antibody response in someone who's recovered, if you've got antibody that's protected, that can tell us two things. One is it can give you a hint about what we need to do with a vaccine. And two, it can return people to the workforce. And we can talk more about that if people wish. But that's, and you, you're hearing that, I think, from Governor Cuomo and from other people who are chiming in about this. And so I think this is going to change. But I think the recommendations we have now are quite reasonable and will keep people healthy and reduce worry. But I think it's, there's more to come, and this, this will change over time. Great, and thank you very much. And um, as our panelists know, I'm a law professor, not a medical professional. And so when you say shed virus, the way I understand that is you can still be giving off some of the virus. And that while we believe it may be that people who have had the virus and are feeling better are not likely to infect others, we're still in a learning stage. So we don't know that absolutely, but from everything we're seeing, that is what at least in this moment it appears to be. But let, let me just, I know that Dr. Baptista Neto is going to have to leave us in a, <clears throat> a few minutes. So I'm going to just bundle a few questions for you and then, um, and then give, you know, give you that sort of 90 seconds uh, to answer too many questions. And then we'll come back to some of these other medical questions. So here are several, each could take its own hour um, I can't sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't fall back asleep. Um, I am so worried about my family members who are sick or are vulnerable or are healthcare workers. How do I know if I need medication for depression or anxiety? Are there any good home remedies? Right? There's a basket of diverse questions. And if you could sort of give us a lightning response, at least of, uh, quick thoughts and maybe places people can go to look for more. Sure, sure. So, so certainly going back to what I said before, I, I think, you know, trying to use strategies that historically, you know, uh, uh, work for you in terms of uh, stress management. But there's also a good differentiation, right, in terms of when do you need more specialized help, when an adjustment reaction to a tough situation becomes you know, a little more significant that requires, you know, medical care. And I think it's going to be about the severity, how much is that interfering with your day-to-day -day ability to function and well-being, and the timing. I think, you know, what's expected is that a stress adjustment reaction is that with time that should be gradually getting better. You still might have some symptoms that might be somewhat uncomfortable, including sleep. But it's not in the magnitude that seems to be affecting you at a level that you can no longer, you know, function and carry on your day-to-day -day activities, right? The analogy would be someone who's home now with some mild respiratory symptoms, mild fever, mild cough. You don't need to go to the hospital. You're going to basically take some precautions at home, hydration, and rest, Tylenol. But if you start having some respiratory distress or high fever, you got to go to the hospital. So it's about the same is the severity, the intensity, it's how that is affecting your day-to-day -day ability to function and well-being. Mm -hmm. And then you can start with either your primary care physician, if you're already connected or were connected to a therapist or psychiatrist and you haven't seen or talked to them for a little while, might be a time to reconnect. And certainly in our community, we have resources for students, we have resources for faculty, for residents. So I think it's the time to access all the resources that our community uh, has available. Thank you very much. That was a lot of great advice in a very short amount of time. I also want to point everybody in our community to 
um, a link that students have received repeatedly and we will be sending around again, but it's available for everybody um, on the Columbia Health website. There's an area that has coping skills and techniques. And that page also includes a number of crisis hotlines and text lines for anybody who might need at the national level, in addition to for Columbia students having 24 seven lines for crisis kinds of support. So there is a lot of, of good support and guidance uh, out there for people to complement what you've just shared with us. Um, all right, more lightning questions. Um, I'll, we'll do as many of these as quickly as we can. Uh, many people are asking, what about airborne? Can I get this from the, can I be infected through the air as opposed to through droplets? I know there's a long answer, but the, if we can have the, the sort of the non-scientist short version, that would be great. I'll say theoretically, yes. And if you're in a high aerosol, Air potential and aerosolization is for, for things like procedures or resuscitation on a on a sick patient. So healthcare workers are probably at the most risk for this. But uh, it's it's limited, but we can't rule it out totally. And it's in high risk situations that we are recommending the N95s. But it's uh, like it's more it's more no than yes. An N95 for everybody's benefit is a very specialized kind of mask that's typically used for healthcare workers who are doing procedures where there is risk of droplets. Waffle, well, yeah. did you want to add anything to that? With a risk of aerosol as, as well as droplets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important to, to keep stressing that most healthcare workers are using regular surgical masks and not the N95 masks. And it's only restricted for people who are uh, intensely aerosolizing uh, or suctioning patients and so on. Uh, I again, I think we don't know enough about um, uh, the issue of aerosol versus droplet. But again, let's. Um, I always tell everybody uh, to worry about the most likely uh, mode of transmission rather than the least likely, um, and focus on trying to do the right things to prevent the most likely source of transmission, which is, as we know, is droplet transmission either uh, directly uh, somebody coughing and sneezing on someone or somebody coughing or sneezing on a surface and then you touch that surface and then touch your, uh, your nose or mouth or eyes. So that's, I always say focus on the most, uh, how most peop people are uh, getting infected and I think that's, uh, that's the best thing we can do now. And don't envy an N95 wearer because if you've ever put one of these things on, you mm -hmm. feel like you're being asphy asphyxiated with them. 30 minutes, so yeah. hard to wear them all day. The other thing I would mention is that if you compare this to a truly airborne virus like measles, that you can walk into a room where that's empty at two, up to two hours after a patient with measles has been in that room and you can still acquire it from that. And that's really because it can persist in the air. The only data that I know about that's been published in a major journal is the, the data recently about airborne possibly for three hours after an aerosolization. This was in an experimental system and we don't, so theoretically it's there, but it's, uh, as Wafa said, I think you have to go with the most frequent issues and we'll, we'll learn more. Thank you for that. And Dr. Baptista Neto, I know you may need to, to sign off in a moment. So if you have to pop off, I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody who's watching for the tremendous support and advice. Um, of course, you're welcome to stay on it if you can. Uh, let me ask another question. Um, uh, there, well, there are lots of questions that are, are coming in. Um, <laughs> but one, and, and maybe Dr. Bernitz, I don't know if this is for you, but there's been guidance out there that people who are have left New York City recently <laughs> should self-quarantine or self-isolate. Um, can you give us the 30 seconds on that? Yeah, that goes back to what I said, that there's the assumption that there's widespread community transmission in New York City and potentially we've all been exposed at this stage. They're suggesting that if you're going to areas where there is not yet widespread community transmission by self-isolating for that period of 14 days, you are reducing the likelihood that you may be a vector bringing that into another community. Um, so, so that's where that guidance is coming from. 
I'd like to, though, I saw one of the questions was uh, somebody who, uh, it was a very touching question of someone who's staying with their grandparents and did self-isolate for 14 days and was wondering, should they stay, should they still not interact with the grandparents? And, and the answer is no. The answer is beyond the 14 days, it's okay. Um, and obviously they should be, again, practicing. I don't know where this individual is in which part of the world or which part of the country, but of course, it's very critical uh, to observe all the other uh, prevention methods, and particularly because we're very concerned about the elderly and their vulnerability to developing more severe disease if they do get infected. Thank you very much. Um, another question, um, which I think we may have touched on before, but I'll just ask it again. Uh, if you have been infected, either you know that because you've been tested or you know that based on your symptoms and you've now recovered, are you likely to get the virus again? Is this like the flu where it sort of comes back in variations and, and people are likely to be reinfected just with a different strain? So we don't know, but there is presumption that it's likely that you're immune to this, to the identical strain. Yeah. Uh, and because it, it's not, it's well conserved, the genes are well conserved. It doesn't change as much as influenza, and not to go into the details, but it's very likely that that's why there's so much optimism about a vaccine if we can find the right immunogen, that is what element of the virus to inject and develop an immune response. So I think we'll see that, but the, the virus, this virus changes by major recombinant events, mixing of multiple viruses and species before it gets to us and then it mixes in the food markets at least so far so i think it's not influenza and, and that's a good thing one one good thing in this horizon and also i mean i think i, I keep telling people colleagues and friends who have gotten covid 19 is that the silver lining is in all likelihood they're going to be immune to this so that's i think that's uh that's the message for now as far as we know Yes, and I, re I remember hearing both of you explain this on a task force call in the way that I, as a non-scientist, understood it, which is basically like you just said, that the virus essentially keeps its structure, unlike something like the flu, which in layperson's terms changes structure year over year, which is why new vaccines continue to have to be developed. Okay, another question is about when is this going to end? I know we don't know the answer to that and so much depends on self-isolating, but let me ask you a very particular version of that question, which is assuming that at some point in the coming weeks or months, there's a drop off. And as you've explained to the on calls that I've been on, we, the, the end means that there are no new infections and then three infection cycles pass. So it's zero new infections plus 42 days, basically. If we get to, do you think we are going to get, when do you think we'll get to that point? And what do, what do you think about this idea of a second peak of the virus coming back in the fall or after that? So I'll be quick. I think that it, no one has the, the prognosis on this for sure, but I think it's at least two more months of this. And I think plus then the, 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 the 42 days is not magical. It's from thinking about three incubation periods so that you're sure that you, cases are not gonna come back up, but we don't know. I think we can learn the most from looking at the epidemic curves of, of China and the Hubei province. And I think that tells you that you've gotta wait a good two months when you have lots of cases and you're still on the rise. So and I would, I, so Wafa, please, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt, Scott, just to build on what you just said, is that also keep in mind that we've had an increasing uh, amount of testing. So that's also been a factor in increasing the numbers of cases identified, right? So I think now we're going to stabilize in terms of the amount of testing. So that factor will will play less of a role in, in giving us kind of an erroneous sense that there's an increase in numbers of new infections. Uh, but the numbers of new infections are in New York City are increasing at an alarming rate. There's a doubling every three days, which is, or maybe even three to four days now. And I think we have to watch that very carefully to watch the numbers of new infections, especially with stabilization of testing uh, activities. I think that we have to watch the numbers of hospitalizations, for example, 
as well, which will be very important uh, as another indicator of hopefully that we're turning, uh, you know, flattening the curve. But um, this is going to take uh, this is going to take time, and I think it's very important not to discontinue. Uh, the interventions that we've put in place because that could also prematurely discontinuing these measures would also not be wise uh, whether they are the social distancing or the personal behavioral interventions or some of the restrictions on travel for example because uh, certainly with travel you can reintroduce if somebody's coming from an area that's uh, there's an ongoing transmission that could also introduce and they come to another area and they've relaxed their um, their their social distancing then that could potentially cause another uh, another uptick in the numbers of cases. And uh, China is another who's going to tell us a lot about this because they have had no new infections locally transmitted, but they've had a couple of dozen more per or more per day of new of infections diagnosed in people who are returning or traveling into the country, and they're loosening up their restrictions. So we have to stay tuned because we'll see what transpires in Hubei province and the rest of China. And it, I have to say, it's, it's it, again, as a lay person in this area, it's quite extraordinary, but, it, but as someone who has an interest in history, it's quite extraordinary to read stories about prior pandemics, especially the Spanish flu from just over a hundred years ago and earlier pandemics as well, to see both the changes in, our, in medically how we're able to treat people and how we're able to share pu important public health information but also our vulnerabilities precisely because of the travel that you're talking about. Okay, so I have two very discreet questions and I don't know, maybe Dr. Bernitz, these are for you, I'm, I'm not sure. And then want to go back to a, a question about testing. One is people wonder, is it really okay to take Tylenol and how much can I take? And two, um, a lot, you know, lots of people whose gyms have closed have started running. And so there's a concern that some have written in about many apparently that, you know, runners breathe deeply when they're running and are there risks when you're running past somebody and you're not at the six feet or even if you are. Thank you. So Tylenol is the, the usually the first drug to take to reduce your temperature, um, acetaminophen. The dose is the extra strength, which are 500 milligrams, two tablets every six hours, a maximum of eight tablets a day. So that's a maximum dosing of Tylenol. There's been a lot of discussion about whether or not you can take ibuprofen, which we usually take to reduce fevers. There has been one study that has um, questioned whether use of ibuprofen worsens um, symptoms of COVID-19, but that has not yet, and maybe Scott can, can answer better, not yet. Um, led to a warning to not take ibuprofen for reduction of fever. So we're not discouraging that, but I always say Tylenol first. Scott, is that accurate? Yes, it, totally. I, I think the data upon which the, yeah. the ibuprofen statement was made and taken up is, is shaky at best. But mm -hmm. I think being trying to take the, take the lesser risk area or from anxiety, I think Tylenol first, but I wouldn't hesitate to take the right. And so what we, what we tell patients is take Tylenol first. You can take your two tablets every six hours. If it's really not bringing your fever in between, then you can add in the ibuprofen. Yeah, and I also the same issue has arisen about aspirin. I've heard people also concerned about aspirin as well. So I think I agree with Melanie is uh, go first to uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol. Thank you. And, and, and on the other question about running, um, again, we are telling people that if you can get outside and do some exercise, in most cases it is. Not if you're sick. If you're sick, you need to stay home. But if you're just un under these um, orders to stay home most times, as we're seeing in many of the countries, getting out and exercising is good. Maintain the social distancing. Try and stay six feet apart. But again, reinforcing that for transmission to happen, it usually requires prolonged face-to-face -face close contact. So running past someone is, is unlikely to, and even taking the deep breath as you run past someone is unlikely to um, increase your likelihood uh, unless you happen to run through a cloud of someone's cough. I guess I'll confess right now that when I go running, which I try to do most days, I'm now weaving around to try to keep my social distance. So maybe I just don't exactly need to do that, but I'll stay on the safe side. Okay, we have, Okay, Sorry. go ahead. 
No, 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 go ahead. Let's we, move on. We, have, we have five minutes and still a number of questions. So I, I will ask you just to say um, each something in closing that you think everybody here ought to know. And uh, Dr. Hammer, I know you said something about test. Maybe, maybe what I would appreciate is if at least one of you could say something about testing in the following sense. Um, should people go out and get tested for the good of public health, uh, even if they don't necessarily need to for the good of their own health? Or because there are at least still reputed to be shortage of, shortages of tests and test implements, should people not get tested unless they are in a more medically dire situation? Um, so, we'll have to leave for another day the broader question about why we have an infrastructure that doesn't enable the kind of wide scale testing that we have seen in Australia and in some other places in the world, which has made a significant difference in transmission rates. So I'd love okay. to hear from Wafa and Melanie. I, I already answered, trying to give my opinion about this. And I'd love to hear their views. And my closing statement is gonna be about treatment and the vaccine in 30 seconds. Go ahead, let's, let's take your closing treatment and vaccine. Well, I, just, I just reiterate that there are uh, treatments that are purported to be out there that are being released or, ex or people are trying to get through quote, compassionate release, and, but nothing has been proven to really work. And compassionate release is an important item here, but it's not necessarily always compassionate because we have to maintain the integrity of randomized controlled clinical trials in order to really prove whether something is good or not. And that we have a file full of uh, st studies where people were th thought uh, the compassionate use drug was good when subjected to randomized clinical trials, it caused more death or harm than the, than the placebo control. So, and just as another issue, hydroxychloroquine is one of these drugs and the buy-up of hydroxychloroquine has removed it from the shelves for people who really need it, uh, and particularly patients with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So we're creating shortages in other areas by people hoarding this drug. And the, it is gonna be subject to randomized trials and, is, and, and these are going on now or being, or being brought together, but it's, it's really important. And one thing I would just say, the Ebola experience, where a randomized controlled trial was able to be done in the middle of the Democratic Republic of Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, uh, with violence and attacks against healthcare workers, and they were able to successfully prove what was better beneficial in drugs that were not. And lastly, for the, 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 for the vaccine. I mean, I have to give you about 10 seconds so I can make sure we get to Dr. Al-Sadr and Dr. Go, Bernitz. Please go, go, go around the horn. Go ahead. And just to be clear, I think we could all and our viewers stay on for another much more time than we have. So we'll try to, to find other ways to come back and share this vital information. Dr. al for 30 seconds or so from you. Uh, on testing or in general? <laughs> uh, on whatever you would like uh, to share. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I am. Uh, uh, I did mention when I was speaking about the four things that I wanted everybody to remember, which is really critical to keep in mind now more than ever. And um, and I think the um, and I can go through them again if we have time. But I do think we need to think carefully about what will it take to control this pandemic and to have our actions. We have to prioritize. Uh, we don't have the luxury of doing what we what would be nice to know or, you know, but we have to do what is necessary to do. And that's, I use that same analogy when people ask me about testing is we need to use testing now so we can control this pandemic. That's how I feel. And I think that's really critical. I'm also an infectious disease person. I would like to know, it might be nice to know if people are transmitting, if they're asymptomatic. It might be nice to know if people who are worried have the virus or not. All of these things are, not, are interesting questions and very interesting for me as a researcher as well. But I feel like we need to focus now on what do we need to know, what we must do, and what we must do in order to control this pandemic at this point in time. And that means... And that means making choices. And I think that's the choices we're making in terms of the guidance that's being offered. It's really centered on how can we control the pandemic. 
Thank you so much. And one thing we'll try to do is distill some of these key points that you've shared. Maybe you can share them with us and find places to share them also on the University Life website. Um, Dr. Burnett, your last uh, moments on, on this advice for the community or anything else you'd like to share? Uh, so mine really follows on from, from what Wafa said is right now the best we can do for the majority of people is to stay home. Um, to, to do our part, you're, you're in environments, not necessarily by yourself, and that's okay, but staying within that, within your home, with the people you're home with, is preventing spread and transmission. While you're doing that, maintaining your routine and using the resources that are available. I think we're so fortunate that we're living in this virtual world that we can all connect like this. There are a number of resources that are available to you, so while we're living under the new normal, we can maintain some sense of normalcy as we get through this as a community. That is sage advice, finding ways to connect, gather information, use valid information as, as everybody has shared. You can find all of that on the Columbia University COVID-19 website. You can always find student life resources on University Life's website. I do invite you again to write to us at universitylife at columbia.edu to let us know what other kinds of forms you might want to uh, have to talk more about this pandemic. And now, uh, please all join me in thanking uh, our fantastic and generous experts who joined us today who have been so generous with their time and their uh, wisdom for us all. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. And we will share this with you tomorrow as soon as it's up online, the recording is up online. Have a good morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are. Goodbye Thanks. now.